I'm Zach, and we want to welcome you to Neighborhood Church, a place where you can belong before you believe. We are so glad that you and your family chose to join us for our worship experience this morning. If it's your first time joining us, we just want to say welcome to the neighborhood. We would love to get to know you and your family better, so please take a moment to fill out the connection card from the seat back in front of you. And if you're watching online, you can find the same form on the connection tab. House groups are the heartbeat of Neighborhood Church. We meet throughout the month to do life together. If you're not plugged into a house group, be sure to stop by the Welcome Center or email info at myneighborhoodchurch.live. Lastly, before you silence your cell phones, please take a minute to check in and like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website to be sure to stay up to date on everything we're doing here at Neighborhood Church. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you and your family back here next week for one of our worship services at 9 and 10.30 a.m. Here at Neighborhood Church, our mission is to help you find Jesus, be a neighbor, and win the neighborhood. God is good. Oh, I like that. God is good. And all the time. You know, we could just, uh, yeah, we could... <laughs> We, 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 could, uh, we could expand that um, to include so many of the attributes of God, couldn't we? You know, we could say, God is faithful. And all the time. God is kind. And all the time. God is powerful. And all the time. God is loving. And all the time. God is caring. And all the time. God is so good, isn't he? I'm telling you, we have such a privilege in this country to, to gather in his name and to worship a really, really, really good God. I want to talk to you this morning about one of those attributes of God this morning that uh, it's, mentioned, it's actually mentioned more than any of the other attributes that we, that we can think of when we mention all of the good things and the great attributes of our God. This, this one thing is mentioned more than any of those combined. It's mentioned 637 times in the Bible. And as we think about this one thing this morning, and as we focus on this one thing this morning... Um, I, I'll just go ahead and say it. It's, it's probably the one attribute of God that, that, that many people like to hear about the least. Um, they they kind of aren't, aren't as comfortable hearing about this, this one thing when it comes to God. But it's this one attribute of God that I want us to focus on this morning that if you have an understanding of it, if you have an, even just the smallest understanding of it, if you ever experience it, in a very real, very authentic, genuine way, it just may bring you to your knees. It just may cause you to fall on your face in worship. It just may cause you to, to, to tremble a little bit when you think about it, when you, when you get, get into it. This one attribute that you may not want to hear about that much this morning may be the very one that you need to hear the most. I want to talk about a holy God this morning. How many of you know that we serve a holy God? Oh, he's a good God. He's a faithful God. He's a kind God. He's full of righteousness. He's a just God. He's a, he's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's full of all of those things. And he's a holy God. He's a very, very holy God, and I want to talk to you about the holiness of God this morning. So I want to ask you, if you would, just to join me in just another moment of prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you so much today. We thank you that you are holy. God, we thank you that you are righteous, that you are good, that you are loving. God, we thank you that you are here, that you are ever-present. You are the same God yesterday, today, today and forever, and you're here in this moment as well, and God, we pray that as we experience you, and we recognize your holiness, that we would be humbled, we would be repentant, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, because you alone, God, are worthy of our praise, you alone, God, are worthy of our worship, our time, our attention, speak to us, stir us, shake us today, we pray, 
And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. I want to take you back to a passage of Scripture that, that we've preached from before multiple times here. And it's a powerful passage of Scripture. Um, the prophet Isaiah speaks in Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Here's what he said. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I want to give you a little bit of context to this passage of Scripture to maybe give us a little bit of understanding, maybe expand our bandwidth a little bit in, in understanding the, bre- the, 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 the gravity of this passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, what we need to understand is that King Uzziah became king when he was 16 years old. He became the king when he was 16 years old, and he reigned for 52 years after that. So when you think about that, King Uzziah reigned for an entire generation, for an entire generation, an entire lifetime for many people. It was all that they knew, his reign, his kingdom, his rule, uh, the, 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 the politics of that day, the spiritual climate of that day. And, and theologians tell us that uh, this was kind of the end of an era, if you will. So when he said, at the, in the year that King Uzziah died, he could have said, at the end of an era, at the end of an era, this was a, a time when, when people, uh, a season when people felt anxious, a season when people felt scared, a season when people felt unsettled. This was an end of an age, an end of an era. It was a time of, of unsettled and, and settlement and restlessness and anxiousness in the culture because King Uzziah had died and things that were happening in society at that time left people restless and anxious. It sounds a lot like a season that many of us live in today, a season of unsettledness, of anxiousness, of, of restlessness, of uncertainty. And in the midst of this turmoil and tension and in the anxiety, the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord. We could just stop right here. We could just stop right here, drop the, drop the mic, stand and worship. In the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of my unsettledness and your unsettledness and the things that are happening in this nation and in this world today, the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord seated high and on a throne. He said the His robe filled the temple. Above the Lord were these six-winged seraphs. There were multiple seraphs. There were seraphim. I don't know if you've ever Googled seraphim. If you've never done that, do that. Not right now, but do that. Do that and take a look. Artists have given some some pretty amazing renditions of what a a seraph looks like. They were these these amazing uh, beings, sort of angelic but but different. They they had six wings. Isaiah said the seraphim that he saw that were that were above the Lord and they were circling and they were they were praising Yahweh. They had six wings. They had two wings that covered their eyes to shield them from from the utter glory of God. They had two wings that covered their feet because they were, they were positioned near, near a holy ground, and with two wings they would fly. And the Bible says Isaiah saw these creatures, and they were shouting or singing to one another, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. The Greek word was Kadesh. They were shouting and singing Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh. Holy is the Lord. This is, this is what they were crying out. This is what they were singing in the presence of God Almighty. These seraphim, seraphim literally, literally means burning one. 
burning ones, these, these creatures. I saw one rendition online when I, I Googled this week, just pictures of seraphims, and one rendition had these creatures just kind of glowing as you could imagine a, a star in the sky, these burning creatures, burning like a, a star would, would burn and shine in the sky, so bright, so angelic, so, so, so majestic. They were burning. It's the only time in Scripture that these creatures are even mentioned. They're just so magnificent, so rare, so special. They were circling the Lord on his throne, singing and crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy. Holy, Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh is our Lord, singing and crying out these angelic beings and creatures. In the Hebrew language, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew uh, artists and songwriters and writers and, and, and speakers, anytime they wanted to emphasize something that was extremely important, extremely significant, they would repeat the word. Jesus repeatedly in Scripture would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. When he wanted to emphasize, this is important, sit up straight, take note, listen to what I'm about to say. Verily, verily, I say unto you. And these angelic beings, these, these seraphim cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. It's the only attribute in Scripture that's mentioned three times for emphasis like that. You never see in the scripture the, the mercy, mercy, mercy of the Lord mentioned. You don't even see the, the love, love, love of God mentioned. But we see his holiness here emphasized in the Hebrew. Kodesh, Kodesh, Kodesh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now in our culture, holiness gets thrown around pretty broadly. If, you, if you've been brought up in the church, you're probably familiar with uh, Holy Communion, right? Holy Communion or maybe Holy Matrimony. Uh, if you were brought up in, 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 uh, in, in, in the Monty Python era, you're familiar with the Holy Grail, right? Some of you are completely lost. You need to stay lost. Don't even Google that one. Um, you, you, you're familiar with these terms. There are a lot of terms in our, in our society that have been paired up with words that really don't make sense when it comes to holy, like holy cow or holy moly or holy smoke. I've even heard people say, holy hell. Now, that really doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, Christianity. That word holy has been even given a, a negative connotation when paired with certain things. Christians have been labeled sometimes, and you're familiar with this, holy rollers, right? Or holier than thou. Either one of those in today's culture is really, most of the time when you hear that, not a real compliment. Those terms usually come out of someone's mouth who is referring to someone that they consider a little bit weird, a little bit off, a fanatic, or, or maybe judgmental and rigid and hypocritical. Holier than thou, those holy rollers, if you will. Can I tell you what holiness really means? Holiness means to separate. It means separate. It means, it means to be to be different. It means to cut. It means a, a cut above, to be separate, to be called out different, to separate from, to be cut away and cut from, a cut above. It's kind of like this. We got dishes at home that we use to, to eat on every single day. You probably do too. We've got, we've got paper plates. We eat on those almost every day in our house. But then we've got some dishes that probably came from Walmart or maybe Target or maybe Bed Bath & Beyond. And, and, and that's, that's kind of the everyday dishes, you know. We'll eat a hot dog on those dishes. We'll eat a hamburger on those dishes. And we'll eat some spaghetti on those dishes. But occasionally, I mean, it's very rarely. Does anybody have fine china in your house? You got some that you bought, you got for, for your wedding. Maybe, maybe it was handed down from your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother. I mean, we've got some that was passed down to us from, from Polly's, Polly's grandmother. It's Christian Dior fine china. I mean, this stuff is like laced, I don't know, gold or silver or something around the edges. Um, and, and that stuff, you know where it stays in our house? High and lifted up. 
It, it is separate. It is a cut above all the other. We would never pull it out to eat a hamburger on it or pull it out to eat a sloppy joe or spaghetti. It is the fine china. It is separate. It is kept separate. It is high and lifted up on a shelf somewhere in our house. It is, it is this almost like sacred, fine fine uh, china that we only use in special occasions. Can I tell you this morning that the God that we serve, the God that we worship, he is separate. He is a cut above. He is set apart. He is holy. He is Kadesh. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible says in Exodus 15, 11, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, completely, thoroughly, fully, entirely holy? Our God is all pure. He is all righteous. He is perfect. He is without fault. He is without blemish. He is infinite. He is immutable. He is immeasurable and incomprehensible. He is self-existent. He is self-sustaining. He is self-sufficient. Listen, our God has wisdom that he never even had to learn. He has strength that he never even had to earn. Listen, he, he has love that he never had to receive to know how to give. He is the same God as Pastor Zach said yesterday, today, and forever. And he is holy. He is set apart. He is special. He is different. There is no one like our God. Isaiah went on to say this. He saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne, and the, the temple shook, the doorpost shook, the seraphims were shouting and, and crying out to one another and singing, holy, 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 and he goes on, and in verse 5 he said, woe to me, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes <clears throat> have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now this is so, so important. I want you to watch this. Isaiah doesn't join the seraphim in, in praising God. He doesn't stop in worship, but he confesses. He says, woe to me, I am ruined. Another version said, I am undone. I am ruined. God, in this passage, doesn't say a word. He didn't say a word. Isaiah, in the presence of this holy God, immediately is, is moved to say, I am a sinful man. These lips, these lips are unclean. Woe is me. I am ruined. I am undone. And God didn't even have to say a word. He never said anything. God just was. That's how holy, that's how, set, that's how set apart, that's how magnificent the God that you and I serve is. God just was. His presence alone was enough to convict Isaiah of his need for forgiveness. The presence of God alone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. Listen, that is so humbling. That is such a humbling. It should, it should cause every one of us in the room today to take notice. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. You know who Isaiah was? He was God's man. He was the prophet of God. He was God's mouthpiece. His lips were the most sacred, most holy, most anointing thing on his entire body, the most, the most holy thing about him. And he said, I am a man of unclean lips. Billy Graham said this. He said, only when we understand the holiness of God will we understand the depth of our sin. And if I could add to that, I think only when we experience the presence, the, the real presence of God, can we even recognize our own sinfulness. I love that Isaiah, a couple of things here, I love that Isaiah confesses his own sin before he acknowledges the sin of his community. The first thing he does is he said, I am a man of unclean lips. Then he said, I live among a people of unclean lips. And we have a lot of self-righteous Christians 
in our society today, don't we? We're, we're really good at pointing out the wrong and the sin all around us. I want to take just a second to, uh, to acknowledge something very significant that we've all witnessed over the last couple of days. I stand before you today so thankful, so thankful that the Supreme Court justices of, of our great land have overturned the Roe versus Wade decision to move us in a direction. That's a good time to clap if you want to clap. <laughs> Absolutely. To move us in, in, in a direction back to a place where we're honoring the sanctity of life. I'm thankful for, for the progress. I'm thankful for the decision. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a landmark decision. It has been decades and decades in the making. God said in the book of Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. While you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I'm so thankful for the, the millions of, of innocent lives that potentially will be saved be, because of this. Now listen, I'm also very aware that there is much, much work to do. So much work. You, you, you know what this means for, for, for all of us in our culture and our society today who have been praying for this for so long, fighting this fight for, for, for so long to see this come about? You know what that means for us? You know what that means for God's church? Let's just bring it on us right here. You know what that really means? It means we've got our work cut out for us now. Because there are going to be more mothers in need of help. There are going to be more mothers in need of care. There are going to be more babies to be fostered who need a loving, godly home to be raised up in and brought up in than we have ever seen in the last 50 years. Listen, our work is cut out for us. We celebrate, many of us celebrated, those of us who are, who are for life, we believe that every life is important, that every life matters. We, we've celebrated the last couple of days, but I'm also not naive to the fact that there is a large portion of this country that feels very different about that. I saw headlines on, 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 on the news the last couple of days as I was watching captions that, 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 that some were saying that this is the political leaders in our nation or were saying in press conferences, this is the darkest day our nation has ever seen because of this decision. That's how divided this nation is. While many of us are, are, are celebrating that, that lives will we'll be saved. Others are saying this is the darkest day in our history. Can I tell you this? That, that all of the greatest revivals in the history of this world have one thing in common. Wickedness. Wickedness. That the evil of that, the evil of that day, the evil of that culture had metastasized to the point where it was ripe for a great revival. And can I just tell you that I feel that this nation is ripened for another great awakening. There is evil in this land like we have never seen it before. But we serve a holy God, a holy God who is seated high and on the throne. He is high and on the throne. My prayer is this, that the greatest movement of life that this country, that this world has ever seen would sweep through this nation, that it would begin in God's church, that it would begin in God's church. You know, self-righteousness is only possible when we compare ourselves to other people, it's the only way it's even possible. We look at other people and we go, oh, they're, they're and they're this. So I, I would just say this. I would just say this to us. It's, it's God's church and you're my, my church family. I would say, let's be, let's be careful. Let's be careful with our, how, how we celebrate. Let's be careful with our, with our words. Let's be careful with our, with our stand. Let's be careful with, with our fight. Listen, 
to crucify those who we are called to reach is a very ineffective evangelism strategy. Let's be a light. We live in a day that the Bible prophesied about and said in, in those last days that light will be called darkness and darkness will be called light. Good will be called evil and evil will be called good. That's the day that we live in. That's the day that we live in. Here's what I've learned. In the presence of a holy God, I'm not concerned about their sin. In the presence of a holy God, I'm not concerned about your, I'm not concerned about anybody else's sin but my own. In the presence of a holy God, I am aware of my own sin. Isaiah said, I am ruined. I am lost. I am undone. I am destroyed. He didn't negotiate with God in that moment. Read this passage. He, he didn't negotiate with God. He didn't try to say, you know, okay, God, I'm, I'm sorry, God. If you will just forgive me, I know I did this. And, and if you'll forgive me, I'll, I will change. He doesn't do any of this. And then all of a sudden, God sends this seraphim with a burning coal and touches his his lips and says, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. This is how good our God is. Our God initiated the atonement. Our God initiated the forgiveness. Our God is the one who initiates the redemption in our lives. If you don't believe me, Romans 5 and 8 said, while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Are you thankful for that this morning? That we serve that God that initiates, initiates the love, initiates the forgiveness, initiates the atonement. He is holy. That's who our God is. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Listen, if God is holy, God cannot sin. If God cannot sin, he cannot sin against you. If God can't sin against you and won't sin against you, isn't he the most trustworthy being that even exists? Everyone else can hurt you. Everyone else can let you down. Everyone else but God. God cannot, will not sin against you. He's the most trustworthy being that there is. He is so holy, you can trust him. You can trust him. You can trust him to, 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 to dedicate your life with passion, to serve him, to obey his, his words, to, to live by his holy scriptures. He is a holy, holy, holy God. Isaiah said, in, as he go, went on in verse 8, Then I heard the vo voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. See, the presence of God changes us. The presence of God changes us. Listen, and I say this with all the love, all the love that I can possibly say it. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're sitting in God's house and you're sitting in, in, a, in a worship service and you're attending church week after week and month after month and year after year and there's no change that has taken place, there's no change that takes place in your heart then it's, it's time, it's probably way past time to have a major soul searching, a gut check and soul searching, God, has anything changed in my life? Am I moving closer to you? Is my faith growing? Is my faith getting stronger? Because the presence of God changes things. It changes us. His holiness changes us. It humbles us, and his holiness empowers us. The presence of God and his holiness empowers us. Isaiah went from a man with unclean lips to, here I am, send me. Here I am, ruined and undone, a sinner, a man of unclean lips to his next breath. Here I am, God, send me. The presence of God, the authentic, genuine presence of a holy God changes us. It does some things in us. It empowers us in our lives to do something for him. It motivates us. 
when we have an understanding of the presence of God and experience his holiness, when we have a a healthy, holy fear of God and reverence of God, it does some things. Psalm 111 tells us that it gives us wisdom. Exodus 20.20 tells us that it will keep you from sin. 2 Corinthians 5 and 11 says that it will motivate you into evangelism. Just one chapter later, Isaiah prophesies. 700 years before the birth of Christ. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Listen, Jesus is God in the flesh. Isaiah prophesied. He went on, this man of unclean lips, repentant before a holy God, motivated him to go on and do the work of God, to go on and be God's mouthpiece, to go on and be God's voice, to go on and pave the way for the Messiah, that, he, that Emmanuel would come, that the virgin would conceive and give birth to a son. He is holy, perfect, and loving. Jesus, the son of God that Isaiah prophesied of, he came to this world set apart. Jesus is cut above. Jesus is separate. He lived a sinless, sacrificial life. Why? For you and me. For you and me. Why did he do it? For you and for me. He didn't come for the righteous. He come for the unrighteous. The holy came for the unholy. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Is anybody thankful for that God this morning? And here's what I know. He is here. He is here. He is here. And he is a... Holy, holy, holy God. Listen, our God is not a God that we are to enter into our relationship with him just flippantly or just casually. But one that we should enter into with a holy fear in reverence, in awe for. He is God Almighty. He is holy, holy, holy. And he is here. And his presence changes things. It changes us. It changes everything. And he's been changing lives for 2,000 years. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me this morning. I have a a bit of a heavy heart this morning, and here's why. I see people far more than I've ever had before, Christians walking away from God, walking away from their faith, treating God their relationship with God, treating their relationship with God's church so, so, so casually. And even many of the faith walking away from the faith, just leaving it behind. It's more of just an afterthought in their lives. Can I just say this morning that I got to stay. I got to stay. I got to stay with him. I got to stay with his church. I got to stay with his people. I need the power of God. I need the presence of God. I need the, the holiness, the cleansing holiness of God in my life. More today than ever before. We need his power. We need his presence. We need his mercy. 
I, I am a man of unclean lips before you this morning. And I live among a people of unclean lips. We are sinners who need a Savior, who need a holy God. We need His presence in our lives. We need it today. W listen, where can I go? Where, where can you go? People that I see leaving the faith, where are you going to go? Who else can save you from your sin? Who else can forgive you of your sin? Who else can comfort you? Who else has promised to never, ever leave you and never forsake you? Who can heal you but God? Who can save you? Who redeems you? Who is always for you but God? David said, with every bone in my body, I will praise him. Lord, who can compare with you? Who else rescues the helpless from the strong? Who else protects the helpless and poor from those who rob them? Who is our God? He is holy, holy, holy. And I feel like in these days that we live in, God is calling his church. Listen, he's calling his church to take him serious. To take their relationship with him serious. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He is merciful. He is caring. He is kind. He is loving. Yes, he's faithful. But he's also holy, and that holiness demands our best. It demands our everything, not our leftovers, not our casual embrace with him. It demands our everything. I have a question for you this morning. When is the last time? And I don't say this as an indictment. I don't say this to, to preach down. I say this to, to, to us as maybe a wake-up call. When is the last time that the holiness of God, the genuine, authentic presence of God, moved you to a recognition of and to a place of repentance when is the last time that you took the time to dwell in his presence long enough for the for the light of a very holy and loving God to shine on you like a spotlight to illuminate the unclean lips the spotted blemished heart the need that we have for him. God, help us today. I still believe that when you experience the presence of the holy, of God Almighty, that it will stir you, it will shake you, it will often bring you to your knees in repentance, it will move you, and it will empower you to change and to do greater things 